Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm doing well. How about you? I am. No, I'm okay. I'm all right. Give me a sense of where you are, how you're doing in the in this quarantine environment in the in the midst of a global pandemic. How's it going? Um, I think I think you said it said it best. Sometimes okay is is sort of the best you can get. And I think I think a lot of us are sort of dealing with how to fill that okayness. And I think that's sort of been where I'm at. Um, but I, I think that I'm doing, you know, all things considered, I'm, I'm trying to fill my time with things that are going to, you know, build my, you know, build my creativity, but also just to like honor myself as a, as a human being who sometimes needs a break. And uh, I am hoping that, 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 you know, some of the moments where I feel like I can take that break uh, are going to serve me well, so. Give me a sense of, well, who is Olive? Who's Olive? Who are you? Um, well, I'm Olive. I am a 19-year-old from New York City. Uh, and I, I guess in the most broad terms, I create things. Um, I am a creator of some sort at all times. Um, I... I guess I, I've chosen a lot of different different mediums, um, but that is sort of how I define myself more broadly. Um, and I guess to get into a little bit of the specifics, um, I am a musician uh, as well as a visual artist. So I, I create uh, visual art using a lot of different mediums, but mostly makeup um, as well as film and photo. Um, so those are sort of my chosen creative mediums. Uh, I also dabble in writing a bit, um, where I sort of connect the other types of art that I do to, uh, I guess, more of a sociological sort of uh, outlook on, on, on things. So I, I'll, I'll sort of write a lot of thought pieces and, and all of that. Um, so yeah, I, I like to, uh, I like to put things out into the world, I guess is the best answer. What were you expecting? You'd never heard of FM 2030, I assume. Um, uh, no, no, not really. I mean, I, I, I went to the new school, so I knew of him as somebody who was associated with the school, uh, just like had heard of his name in passing, but had no idea, um, about like anything that he had, had done or his philosophies, uh, before hearing about uh, the film 2030 so so what was so you didn't have much of an expectation so tell me your I mean what did well, what was the experience of watching the film like and um what did you glean what what are you left with what are you well I mean there's a whole bunch of questions that can lead from that but that sounds like a good, good beginning anyway well, I mean, when I when I heard when I heard about the film, sort of through a, a friend of my mom's who I had been working with, um, I didn't really know what you know know what to expect in the way that like I I I, I had never been exposed to futurist or transhumanist philosophies before really other than again having them be kind of mentioned in passing in classes so um I went in with very few expectations really not even having known what the premise of those types of philosophies are and I think um when you hear words like that you sort of or at least for me as a student when you hear something with like ist at the end you sort of have this expectation that like you're about to be hit with like a whole lot of crazy philosophical mumbo jumbo that like you're probably it's gonna go like in one ear and out the other um if you're not like a person who you know is that's not really your thing um so I mean, maybe part of me was sort of a little scared that I was going to kind of have that experience that I've sometimes had in classes and just been like, ah, uh, this is totally just going through the, the crevices of my brain and not really, you know, resonating. But I was actually really, you know, pleasantly surprised that I, I felt as if when it boiled down to it, a lot of the, the messages I took from the film were not that in any way, really, because I think the the actual you know the actual philosophies of, of futurism and transhumanism are so they almost sort of feel like anti-philosophies in, in some kind of way where it's not necessarily 
about building a, at least to me, what resonated with me is it didn't feel like it was about building this, this theoretical framework as much as it, as it was looking at the practical, you know, ways in which the world works and just saying, you know, where we are is not where we should be. And I think that is something that resonated with me because I also, you know, have been involved in a lot of activism and things like that, you know, from everything from, you know, gun control to climate change to, to, you know, livable wages and all of that, you know, I've been very invested in that just as a, as a, you know, as a New Yorker, as a student, as, as all of those kinds of things. So to me, what I really took away from, from the film is, is kind of this ideology that's sort of based on where, where we are is not where we should be and what, what it looks like. But instead of sort of brooding on that, how, how do, how do we get there? And, and what does this sort of futurist optimism look like? And that was, that was definitely my biggest takeaway. I and mean, it's funny, as you say, I start, start going down my own philosophical rabbit hole, like, and I guess where I come to is where we are is where we are, but we don't have to stay in that place. And then so that I, I would sort of, I guess for me, shift it slightly. You know, again, I don't really define myself as a transhumanist. I don't even define myself as a futurist. I mean, I think of myself as a human being that wants to be as good as I can be. And whether that's transcending my limitations um, because I can get an implant, great, I'm all for it, I'm lazy. If I can get a language downloaded into my brain because I haven't been that good at French or Italian or whatever, I'm up for it. You know, that's not, that doesn't, that doesn't freak me out. Basically, it appealed to you because it, was, it, it didn't seem to be imposing all sorts of things on you. I mean, that's what I'm getting. Is that right or is that? that de- no, that definitely is, is sort of what I'm trying to say. Like it didn't feel as if it were imposing anything. Rather, it felt as if it were, you know, I don't know if suggesting is the right word because I do think that it does, you know, it, it does pose a very, very, very strong, you know, case for, for viewing things in, in a more futurist, in a more transhumanist way. It definitely does that. So it's not necessarily like it was a, a gentle suggestion, but I don't think it felt overly, you know, overbearing in its, in its sort of, um, in its, in, in the way it was, in the way it was posed. And that was why it was very, attractive to me as somebody who is a seeker of change who is somebody who is very much involved in in a journey for change and i think it put a different spin and, and more of a more of an optimistic spin on the way that you know i that the way that we viewed or at least i viewed everything and i think that you know the question that is posed a lot about kind of this nostalgia for the future was very interesting to me because I tend to, and at least now, I think, you know, especially since the 2016 election, everything as an activist for me felt very bleak for a very long time. And I think there are definitely times where it still falls into that. And and, and as an artist as well, because I think those two parts of my identity are very uh, interconnected. Um, so it felt as if I was sort of creeping into this void that was that was on this con- consistent downward spiral, and it didn't feel like there was this, you know, optimism or nostalgia for the future. It felt as if there was we were getting caught in a nostalgia for the past. We were getting caught in, oh, things were so much better, you know however many years ago, things were so much better before Trump got elected. Things were so much better, you know, 10, 20, whatever years ago, even, even, you know, in times, I I found myself even being nostalgic at times for before I was born, you know, (laughs) as an artist, as an activist, and like realizing that all of, and then even, but even then, you know, people who lived through those eras probably had that same mindset because there were obviously all these terrible terrible things that have been happening throughout history and it's so easy to kind of um 
it's so easy to look at the world in this very black or white way. And I think what was very interesting to, to me, because I think that I don't, I don't create very well when I'm looking at the world as either completely rosy or completely bleak. I think what was really interesting is, is uh, the philosophy of, of futurism and transhumanism, and especially with the concept of nostalgia for the future, it adds this, it, 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 it at least poses this very like, you know, we have, we have a goal. And that is something that I don't think a lot of people have felt for a very long time. So, I mean, look, my, a lot of science fiction and look, a lot of films, because I think it's easier. And look, the media in general tends to play not just on this nostalgia of our past. And I think nostalgia is like a really powerful thing. And it's a weird thing because if I think back, I mean, if I think back, I've been very nostalgic from my childhood, which wasn't amazing, but, 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 but particularly London and being in London. And yeah, you know, it's, it's as much as I, if I think about like, if I start to sort of drill down into it, I see that there are so many pictures that I paint for myself that seem really warm and nice and cozy and like homely. And yeah, if I can project, project what that my life was like living in London, like it wasn't, it's this really powerful projection that I think lets us sort of wallow, wallow in sort of feeling sorry for ourselves or, you know, hoping that we're going to recapture elements of whether it's our childhood or, or some bygone age where things were great. But the, as FM points out a lot, like most of those bygone ages may have been okay for the kings and queens or the people in power, but they weren't so good for, for, for Jews or, or, or people of color or, or black people or, or or um, women or whatever. So, so, you know, we do that. And so this idea of nostalgia for a future, when so much of the futures that have been painted for us have been bleak. As somebody who watches films, who likes science fiction, who again, from having seen some of your art, like is drawn to the dark. I don't know, maybe you don't call it dark. Maybe, it, maybe for you it's framed a different way, but tell me a little bit about that. I think so for me I I definitely for a very you know for a very significant portion of my life I could even probably say since I can remember have definitely been drawn to this very to this sort of everything that is sort of like macabre and and I guess dark is sort of sort of a, a, an okay word to use uh but definitely more so like I, I like things that are definitely like sensational and horrifying and, and in a lot of ways. Um, and that definitely is weird. And I know that. Um, and I think that it, but, but I fully embrace it. And I, I think the, the reason being is that I think it, you know, for, for me, it provides this, in this embrace of, of things that we're told not to embrace. Um, and it, it, you know, but I don't think that that should ever really be confused with, with, you know, an acceptance of bleakness or an acceptance of this sort of eternal void that we feel. Um, it's more so for me, accepting that even as we, as far as we progress, there are always going to be new horrors. There are always going to be new things that are, dark there's always a dark underbelly and i think that especially looking at where my cat is. i know she's got a cameo so i think that you know for me i'm very much i think i'm i think i i, I think my art as surreal as it is at times it also captures this this kind of realism and, and this acceptance of um of this kind of this kind of darkness especially um, especially under, like, I, I think I work definitely within the framework of, and I guess this is not, not very, you know, not very in line with, 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 you know, actually, I don't know if I can necessarily say it's not very in line with futurism, but I definitely at least take where, take where I am and create from it and take where we are as a collective. And, and so it, it definitely is this kind of there's it's this surrealism that comes from a sense of realism and comes from the acceptance of of this sort of this sort of 
a growingly dystopian this dystopian feel to to the world and um but I also think that like what's in what's interesting for me about that is I never want that to be confused with complacency because obviously I am a person who very much strives for a world where there are there are less real life horrors that the horrors exist in the horror movies and things like that. One of the things that was that I guess for me was the most interesting thing about FM versus some other philosophers that sort of posit ideas about the future is it really did focus on our psychology, you know, and the fact that we are so sort of influenced by our evolutionary, our evolutionary biology. And so that if we can um, do away with some of the things that plague us, I don't think that means to say that when there aren't going to be, you know, um, things that scare us or things that, play on us or, or jealousies or, or various, you know, the, the sort of gamut of some of the human emotions. So on the journey, tell me about the journey of the movie. You sat down to watch the movie, your, you know, your, uh, your, your friend said, oh, you should watch this movie, you watched it. Like, tell me about the journey of watching the movie and what parts spoke to you, what parts didn't. So I actually watched it twice. I watched it once on my own and then I watched it with my mom. And I think the first time around there definitely was I think, you know, obviously it was very striking to actually hear FM speak because I think that he had such a, you know, had such a, a strong personality and, and a way with being able to express his his ideas in, in this way that always sort of sounded very, like, exuberant. I think that was really striking to me, especially that kind of, the, the beginning sequence was was really, really interesting um, and, and he, getting to hear him. And then I think that, you know, my first sort of initial reaction is like what was so interesting about it is it simultaneously felt like a sci-fi film as well as a documentary and I think that was you know that definitely came through just very very well um because there were definitely times where you didn't necessarily know what was real what was scripted what was like all of you know all of these sort of sort of sort of things you were like these you know you're you're dealing with something that kind of balances the real and the surreal at all times and i think that was the biggest sort of experience that i took away throughout throughout it and i think at times sometimes when you're first watching a film that can feel like a bit frustrating but as it went on like i kind of learned to embrace that that uncertainty and i think it served as like a very you know good metaphor for for kind of the ideas that FM was posing is that like I'm sure he was sort of faced a lot with this oh this sounds way too surreal none of this could ever be possible yet his you know his faith was so unwavering and unshaken that you know the you could hear kind of this realism in the way that he presented his his idea. So that was sort of the thing that ended up really resonating with me, um, as well as I think sort of the more personal, um, the, 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 you know, the way that the, the characters, I think, especially I think the, the talk, talking about religion and faith, because I, I was also raised Jewish. And so I think that the, the relationship back to how we were raised to view life and death was definitely very powerful to me in that sort of near sort of near the end um and kind of seeing all the seeing all the bar mitzvah scenes and all that and kind of remembering what that felt like and and how it it relates to personal faith i think is is you know the idea of defying death because of the way that we're sort of raised to, to view death. And I think in most religions, it's, um, you know, at least in, in a lot of the kind of like major religions, we are sort of, you know, from a young age instilled with this idea of what life means, what death means, and it's just a very natural part of life and where you go after you die and all those kinds of things are, are questions that we really, like if you grow up in a family that even observes religion in any way like those are messages you get from very young so I was definitely coming out of it 
you know, thinking about all of those things that I was taught and thinking about how for many, many years before I, you know, was able to question religion and, and question where I stand with it, those were just what I thought. Um, and so when you kind of, you know, and I'm sure for you, when you meet a figure like FM and you're, you're kind of that whole worldview is, is flipped on its head, at, even just watching the film, it, it caused me to think about those things. So I think those are the two big takeaways for me as I, as I, you know, I watch the film. And I'm sure, again, it's so, it's one of those films that, depending on how you were brought up, how you view life, how you view death, what your political views are, what your social views are, it's going to really impact you in a different way. But I think, you know, as a, as a, you know, being who I am and being and how I was raised, those are definitely the two, two big things for me. The biggest hurdle in some ways is that, and I think we all have some of this, and it is really interesting to me how some people can sort of, well, let me say what this is. That this is that we want things in buckets. We want things to be labeled a certain way. I think just in terms of how our mind works, and I think it's often we want to say, oh, so-and-so is this, and or so-and-so is that. I mean, in the case of this movie, like, is this movie a documentary? Is this movie this? And to me, like, that wasn't, I, I, I've always felt like, you know, a work of art is a work of art, and it, or, 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 or a story is a story. Does it, you know, there are different ways to tell a story that can create an emotion or create a feeling or can, you know, can have an impact, but does it really matter? And, and for a lot of people, it does. I mean, to me, as I watch, as I look at some of the, the um, reviews, how people are really turned off because they expected to see something that was conventionally a documentary or conventionally science fiction or conventionally uh, an autobiography or a, a you know biographical piece on on FM, and they are sort of when it's not that way, that kind of throws them and they're like I hate this or I don't like that, and I think for some people they like that. And I, wa I, I wonder if it's, I don't know exactly what that is, because I think we all have some sort of yearning to put things in buckets. This is the real question, and I, I look at this, and so you'll have to forgive me if I'm being stereotypical, but a little bit. But like, I found that your generation, that's so weird saying that, but yes, your generation, like has all these definitions. There are lots of different definitions. And I wonder how, well, as you think about them as they relate to you, like how static are they? Like how much are they sort of a given, you know, in terms of, I mean, to me, the ones that are most confusing are all the gender ones. You know, those ones are like, you know, it's like a whole, like my, as I speak to my kids and, and my daughter particularly, you know, my head like explodes, like with these diff with the different gender yeah, definitions in terms of our gender and our sexuality. But, one, like if you have a sense for yourself of like how you were able not to be thrown by the fact that it wasn't the one thing. And then as you think about your own definitions or gen definitions in your, in your, um, I don't want to say generation, but in your life, like how much of those are sort of fixed and how much of those, how many of those aren't? I think that what's interesting is with you know, at least from, from my view, and I think from maybe the views of a lot of my peers who are, who are kind of from my generation, I think that like, a, what's, what's interesting is a lot of, even with more language being put to certain things, I think that in a lot of ways, things have become more fluid with the, in our generation. And I think, I think gender is a great example because I think that, you know, even though it sort of feels probably from the perspective of somebody who didn't grow up 100% with a lot of these different, you know, defini definitions of gender, um, when, you know, when my parents were growing up and, and, and even people who are just maybe 15, 20 years older than I am, the definition, first of all, the definition of gender and sex were combined into one. And second of all, you know, the range of gender identity basically was you were either a man or a woman, and you could be either cisgender or transgender, but those were the two choices. Like you were a man, you were a woman, and you could transition from one to the other. And that was sort of, that was what was known at the time. 
Um, and, and that to me feels much more boxed in and much more static than the, than what we know to be, you know, what we know now about gender and, and how, you know, gender and sex are starting to be viewed as separate things. Um, one being biological and one being social and sort of these different, you know, this different range of language that we have to talk about gender identity um, and kind of under the umbrella of what it means to be non-binary or gender non-conforming, that's a huge, huge, huge umbrella. And so I totally can understand how it can be confusing for many, many people. Um, but it also, to me, I think is a great example of how I definitely feel as if things are becoming less static and more fluid because as it's weird, it's a weird paradox, but as more definitions are being posed, I definitely think as if the, I definitely think is it's be actually becoming closer and closer to a lack of need to define oneself. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, because the first conversations I ever had about this in my life were with a fan, you know, and, and, and it was in the context of somebody that, that was at one of his gatherings who was, wanted to transition and he was, you know, giving them, I guess, the confidence to do that. And so I'd never even thought about this stuff in, in, in this way. It's not that so much like that. I can, that's not just about an acceptance. It's more, I can get my head around that partly because I had a really interesting person that sort of taught me that, I guess, but it's more that if I put somebody in, in a, in a bucket that they don't see themselves in, I'm, so that it's it's it feels like i've done something wrong rather than and that it's not so much like i get that we are more fluid and this and again even the word fluid is so it just reminds me of fm so much I and mean, it was all of the like we are becoming more fluid and i you know again somebody who in some ways thrives on that and wants to see that because stasis is terrible i mean stasis is you know i mean well not as bad as regression i guess but um it's when it's, I guess, maybe I didn't ask the question as directly as I should have, because maybe I hadn't thought about it. It's, it's, and I'm thinking again about conversations with my daughter. It's like, if I get it wrong, like I'm saying, oh, so-and-so is this, or that's what it seems like. It's like, I've done something terrible. And so as, as people redefine themselves or put themselves or, or establish a connection to a particular definition, like how static is that and why is it or why does it seem at least to me that people seem to get upset i mean maybe i read i, I go on twitter too much and that's where everyone's getting upset <laughs> but why does it seem as if the definitions are all important rather than like cutting people slack and or maybe i've got it wrong i definitely Didn't expect to have this conversation this is a funny conversation to have but so i i definitely think that you know with I think with the, the I think the important distinction to make is I, I definitely think that with fluidity doesn't necess it doesn't necessarily come with a lack of connection to identity and I think maybe I think definitely for me and I can understand why like it there is I think there will always be a sort of protective protectiveness of personal identity and so when when that is sort of misconstrued by somebody else, I think that it still does feel very personal and can feel very hurtful. Um, I think, you know, there is a conversation to be had about, you know, this idea of understanding that a lot of this fluidity and a lot of the language that is being put to it is very new. And I do think that like, you know, there has to be a level of sympathy on both sides um, for for becoming accustomed to that. But I definitely do think that, you know, and maybe this is because this is how we've historically been taught to think when things were a lot more binary. So maybe this is the remnants of that. But I, I do think that human beings will always have a sort of protectiveness over their personal identity and uh, and and it comes from a place of of you know 
a genuine place of wanting to feel connected to oneself and using these different definitions and using these different labels to express that outwardly. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Um, I, I do think that moving towards a society with, with where, you know, the specifics of a label doesn't necessarily matter is something that is important. Um, but I do think that no matter what, human beings will feel a, a, a sort of protectiveness over personal identity. And I think that's where that, you know, that's where that, and, and, you know, and again, maybe, maybe this sort of construct of life and death and what it, def, redefining what it, what a human life means and what a, what a human life looks like will change that. Because I think that there, there, it could also have to do with this pressure of, finding authenticity in the 80, 90, 100 years that you have. Um, yeah. And it totally, also, but I think. Yeah, I mean, also, I mean, this idea of identity, I think in and of itself is fluid. I mean, and I, I, this is my, the inner FM, right? As you were saying, I was thinking, I wonder what FM would, if I was, if FM was sitting here, like what he would say about, and I think he would say, well, you know, your identity is fluid. You know, you, he would say like today, you may be really comfortable being, blah 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 and you know but tomorrow if you could be and again i'm reminded of somebody in this community who's like well tomorrow i'm going to be a centaur i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to put wings on i'm going to be a half horse i'm going to fly across the planet like and again when i first heard this i was like fucking hell they're they're out of their minds right but i guess if you really had a choice and you're like you know tomorrow i really do i'm going to become i'm going to put on you know the wings of pegasus and i'm going to fly across the planet if you really could do that there's no, you know, apart from it just seems so out there, why not? I mean, and again, that's a really off the wall example, but these are examples of, again, look, my own identity has changed. I mean, it hasn't really changed, but like how I feel about certain things, like what was important to me 20 years ago, or even, even a few weeks ago is less important now. And sort of like, I, I guess at the base, at the basis is more about how I behave and what that says about who I am. But again, we're really jumping down some heavy philosophical rabbit holes um, as we think about, I mean, you said to me in the beginning of this conversation that your identity was about really your vocation, which was being an artist. It wasn't so much, it, it wasn't so much, I'm a woman, I'm, the, you know, I'm from, well, there was New York thrown in there. But, but, but you know, so I wonder, yeah, the experience of this film made at least you you were thought about the sort of or rethought the sort of definition of like you know three score years and ten and that's your sort of lot in life and and then can these other things change? How do you explain the film to somebody? If you'd say to a friend of yours or somebody that you know, what do you tell them about the film? What do you say? Like, watch this film. It is what. Um. I feel like I've said a lot of different things to a lot of different people because I feel like there's something that can kind of appeal to to a very wider range of people and I think you can kind of like you look you know you have a friend who's really into sci-fi and you can be like this is this like kind of half sci-fi half documentary type film about defying death and kind of like make it you know you can definitely frame it in that way and then definitely, you know, you can also frame it in the way like this is a really interesting thought piece about about the future and about the future that we strive to. And then obviously for people who I know, you know, have some sort of knowledge of who FM was, you can, this is a really interesting kind of sci-fi documentary about FM 2030 and his philosophies. Um, so I think it can be framed in a, in a plethora of ways and I've definitely found myself framing it differently to different people um but it always sort of has this element of um it's a it is both a portrait of a you know a figure and his and his philosophies and a you know this kind of thought piece about the definition of a human life and the definition of our you know our world that is made up of human lives um and what it is now and a view of what it could be um if those things were 
were, were shaped differently. Um, so I think that's sort of the constant is, is it, it is, you know, kind of, I kind of explain that, you know, it's, it's thought provoking in the way that it, it raises questions about, you know, morality, life, death, society as it is and as it could be, you know, no matter what you take away from the film, I think the constant is it will raise at least some kind of question about how you define yourself and your life as a human being and some kind of question about how that applies to the world around you. I mean, FM had so many ideas about pretty much everything, whether it was our political system, whether it's about economics, whether it's about um, deaths, relationships, money, you know, what, were there any things that were in there that kind of um, spoke to you or either were original in terms of, because I guess what was interesting about making the film is a lot of the things when I first heard them, I'd never heard them before. And now there are elements of a lot of these things, you know, in other people, whether it's, you know, Esther Perel and some of the things that she talks about in, in terms of relationships or, you know, universal basic income. So I don't know if there were fragments of things that either validated your own. Def I mean, I think definitely I experienced both. I mean, I've been a vegetarian for eight years. And so I think hearing that being spoken about as kind of vegetarianism and veganism being such a, such a quarter, like this, this kind of uh, very essential thing uh, to implement, you know, as a means towards progress was very, something that very much resonated with me because that was something I had definitely thought about for many, many, many years. Um, and I, you know, I went vegetarian when I was like 11 or 12 um, for kind of moral reasons and, and have stuck with it for, you know, now almost, you know, eight, nine years. So, I I think that was something that very much resonated with me, um, and and just made a lot of made a lot of practical sense in terms of thinking about the future, um, as well as sort of the 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 issues of class that were brought up. Um, that you know, and that was definitely something that because I you know I I also am come from a, a a fairly privileged background, especially in terms of class, and I think those were issues that I wasn't forced to think about um until I until I was uh, I think moving to New York when I was around I think I, yeah I was 12 when I moved to New York and so moving to New York and and being outside of my like you know predominantly white suburban bubble was kind of the first time I was really forced to think about those things um I think that the and since then you know has been something that I, I very much grappled with about like where my place in these conversations are you know and how sort of important and yet how important they are for no matter what your class upbringing was to to really understand and I think that the idea of like who are these technologies for who is going to benefit from these these technologies that could change the course of human existence because you know I've always sort of been of the view that you know, when science is for the few and not for the many, when scientific progression, that is, that, that creates, you know, the most, the most inequality, because the most unequal that you can, you can be, and I think this was sort of like, you know, something that was, that was brought up is like living and dead, and so, and that definitely brings up, like, who has the privilege to continue to live and I think that is wrapped up in and especially now that we're what, what we're seeing with with coronavirus like that is definitely wrapped up in everything it's and it's very much related to class it very much is like who has access to treatment for for life-threatening diseases and 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 who has access to the the top of the top kind of medicine um and so as you know as I've gone through my life and, and my, you know, my, I have always sort of, I've sort of realized that, you know, class fluidity is something that is another, you know, another, another thing that I've had to kind of learn, learn a lot about through, you know, personal experience, because I think that when, you know, when you're, when you're up at the top of the top 
of the top, you know, you're up at the top of the top of the top. And then if you're not that class sort of, when you're in the, when you're kind of in the middle, in that middle ground, class is a, vi class is very, very fickle. It's this sort of like, you can have one day and then circumstances can change and you can have a lot less. And that's something that, you know, throughout the course of my life, um, has been something that, you know, I've personally experienced um, with the changing of my family circumstances, divorce, unemployment, things like that. And as a person who does have chronic health conditions and has had a dire need for health care at some times and didn't have the proper access to it when I was used to growing up that way, it definitely... Um, opened my eyes to, you know, being told, oh, no, you can't see a doctor for your chronic pain right now because we don't have insurance um, was something that, and, and the way in which that allowed some of my personal struggles to progress to the point that they became unbearable and I actually had to stop going to school um, was something that was you know, eye-opening to me, and I think that the film dealt with that in a, in a way that, you know, it wasn't as if it were, as if it was, you know, the entire message of the film, but I think that a very, it was, it became a very important keystone in when you kind of had these characters who so clearly and overtly believed that, you know, this technology is, you know, this technology will be used to create this society where where the elite have this access to these very, very, very high level, you know, scientific technologies that can change the course of, of human existence, yet it is reserved for this small chunk of people. Um, and so those were definitely the issues that I had, that I, I saw in the film that that I was very familiar with and that resonated with me a lot. You know, this really is about class and wealth and all the rest of it. And so what is going to happen and how do you make it fair? And how do you make it, I mean, you know, what is the equation for all these things? How do you regulate these things? Actually, a journalist asked me yesterday, like if I was, or whether FM would have been, a, you know, subscribed to these uh, monitoring systems that obviously will help decrease the coronavirus but there are all these like privacy concerns like how much are we willing to sort of relic you know in order to minimize the damage of something like this are we willing to give up some of our privacy and and i guess for me the answer is pretty clear yes you know i mean again you have to trust that the privacy that you're giving up is okay well you know i've been around is my location i don't give a shit like well i've been you know, I'm not trying to kill anyone. I'm not trying to do anything, sneak out. If, if this is, if that is the use and that can help people become less infected or track whatever, I'm fine with it. But these are, but then, but again, that's my, that's my, my answer. But there are a lot of other people who are going to be, no, I don't want the government or technology companies to know. And I don't believe that they're going to use it for this purpose. And they're going to try and sell me detergent or washing up liquid or whatever it is that I want. So, I mean, it's not so much, is this going to happen? It's like, how is it going to happen? And, and who's going to manage it? Because they, they need to be more, more than just, okay, well, we're going to let Congress and the Senate um, manage this stuff. And, and to me, that was part of why I wanted to make this number, because I think it's not so much, are, they, are these things going to happen? It's when and how. And the how is, is all important because, you know, even with all the best intentions in the world and all the best technologies, in the world, there are so many unintended consequences. And this is me as a filmmaker, I'm not a fan. I'm not like, oh, it's gonna be great. And even if we work hard and we're active and you know, we change things, like I, um, I'm a little bit more, um, I don't know, I'd like to think, I just, I'm not gonna say I'm cynical, but I, you know, I do, I, I, I can also see problems. Anyway, I don't know how you feel about that, the unintended consequences or about, um, if we have the technology that can solve a particular problem, like how much, well, how are we going to manage that? This is really for your generation and it is for mine. It's hard because, you know, I think that 
you have to find this balance between like idealism and realism. I think, I mean, with anything, but I think that like for us, you know, because everything for our generation feels really dire because, you know, we're obviously being faced with like a lot of issues. I mean, climate change is probably the one that comes to my mind the fastest and we're kind of always being, you know, shown this information and this like, you know, these real scientific facts about like how our earth is dying and is in a terribly dire state, yet there's a good portion of our government who just completely disregard that um at least in terms or at least are you know afraid of the too afraid of the few who deny that to to really to really kind of speak out against it and that's what's something that's always terrifying and then there's kind of these this very polarized you know view of how you know I mean, just in in essence, how how we should be progressing, and there's very there are very very there's very few you know issues that have that are that are bipartisan enough to actually become you know to actually be implemented. Like there's so you know few issues that we can get people to agree as urgent as they sound. So that's I think what the most terrifying thing is. And I think what it's revealing to to me and to a lot of people is that the problem isn't necessarily with, you know, people on the right, people on the left, all that kind of, it's with the way that the system is structured. It's with this, the idea that like, we are, the way that our system is structured, we have a two-party system and, you know, you got the House, you have the Senate, like, and then, you know, it's, it's just in, in, in itself is part of what is inhibiting a lot of progress. And I think people are sort of starting to realize that the system is not necessarily working for the (laughs) general public. And I think that, I mean, for me, that's something that I've been grappling with from a pretty young age because I was very lucky to have, you know, a lot of the experiences that that I had and also a lot of the people in my life who were awake to that fact. Um, and, you know, I also, I'm a pretty big reader, so I was able to come across a lot of information, you know, that revealed that to me. But I think that for a lot of people, and this isn't to say that this is not, you know, not good. This is just to say that, you know, people have their own journeys with this. I think both the state of the state of politics right now coinciding with a global pandemic is waking a lot of people up to this idea that it's like, maybe it isn't Republicans or Democrats that are not serving us well enough. Maybe it's the fact that the entire system is working for a very small group of people. And how do we then grapple with that, I think, is what becomes the most pressing question for our generation. And you have answers from all the way like from all you have all kinds of answers you have people who are like burn the whole thing down you have people who are like we need to elect more progressive you know people to office you have people who you know are are kind of the idea of just abstaining from the political system altogether like there are so many people and that's what's challenging too is like how do we consolidate you know how do we consolidate across all of those those different points of views and all of this different kind of you know this pandemonium of frustration you know it's 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 hard to to find any kind of solidarity in this realization that it's not one party or the other it is the entire political social economic system and I think that is probably, and I have no answer to that. I, you know, again, I, I have what I think, but I have no answer to how, you know, we as the generation that is kind of growing up and becoming adults in the face of all of this um, are going to deal with that. You know, I am all for, like, I'm definitely a t- the type of person who wants progress in any, you know, wants progress through, you know, ethical means and through 
you know, hopefully nonviolent means and things like that. Like I, I am definitely that the person who has tried to maintain my sense of optimism, but it definitely is really difficult when you kind of are in the face of a, you know, you know, we're not being helped by anybody in our government. No one has any idea how we're going to come together to build some kind of movement to, to fix this. And all at the same time, we're all focused on becoming adults and going out into the world and surviving. It's definitely this very large issue and question that I, I is w definitely one of the things that I don't really know or have any kind of direction on. I think many people who are kind of in my sort of, you know, I would say probably like 18 to 25 age group are sort of like facing right no, now. I, I look I, and, I, and I, all I can say is I'm sorry, <laughs> not that it's my <laughs> fault, but like it must be. I mean, as I think like every generation has its degree of destabilizing things. I mean, just being a teen, coming out of teenage derm is destabilizing, you know, and then you then throw in, you know, a recession, throw in a global pandemic, throw in Donald Trump. I mean, like all of those things are incredibly stressful and destabilizing. Look, the fact that the three, the, the, the major candidates or people vying to be president of the United States, you know, are so old. I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, if I was looking at this from where you're looking at it, it's like, what the, how are these people representing me? I mean, I mean, me in general, but even just in terms of age and then you'll, you know, there are, there's no women. I mean, and so that, that kind of, that, that, that makes sense that, that, that all of these things are sort of coming together in this sort of confluence of stress and like, what can we do about it? And all I can do is like try and summon my inner FM who would, I think, would sort of look to how things have changed. And he was the first person, to, not the first person, literally, but who, who would say to me or to you, like, look, you know, as dire as it seems, you have to sort of look at the, the progress that has been made, even the conversations that I have, you know, whether that is. I mean, I guess just the fact that they passed these two bills, Republicans and Democrats, you know, when they were, they particularly the Republicans, have constantly said that they couldn't do this and they couldn't give money for that. Well, they've just done it, like, you know, 100,000 times over, you know, when, when, you know, partially because they know that they've got no option. Well, they do have an option. I mean, even McConnell said he's going to let the states go bust, like, which just seems so crazy. But we, we're at this sort of confluence of all these things and maybe this pandemic as tragic as it is, because people are really dying and people are really suffering, will sort of bring some of these things to the fore and that, that these things are broken. I mean, FM felt that we had to become catalysts, that this whole sort of like idea of like running for president and you know, this sort of cult of leadership was just organically wrong and again it was that, that really we should be looking at the issues and how can we solve them and figuring out you know and again i don't i mean i know some of the things that he talked about and i don't know how we do that because the other thing that always made me laugh makes me laugh is like you know people in power don't want to give up their power and they're going to fight to the death to keep it and so all these senators and all these congressmen not all of them because I, I i'm not of the view that everybody that goes into politics is bad like, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think some of these people are really bright and, and want to do public service. And then they, they're in a system that doesn't really allow them to because they constantly have to raise money and trying to fight for their next election. And so some of these things have to shift. And how they shift, I don't know. I definitely, you know, I was you know, just talking about, like, just in the context of what is literally currently happening politically, you know, since 2016, even though in 2016 I wasn't old enough to vote, like, I had been a huge, huge gender supporter. Um, and, you know, and then obviously I kind of, again, once the, once the election was happening, I, I, you know, was like, okay, whoever could beat Trump, and then Trump won. Um, so, you know, my view in the more recent, not just in the recent months was like, you know, very much in line with that, like, 
this very, very kind of bleak, like, oh my God, we're in a complete political void disaster when Bernie was falling behind was because I genuinely did not believe that another center left candidate could beat Trump. I was like, we've done that before. It's not going to work again. Trump is going to get another four years. Um, and, and I, I genuinely did like, you know, I, and, and there's definitely a big part of me that still does believe that. Um, so I, so I think that it was really easy to fall into this like borderline depression over how terrifying everything was because I definitely am a person who relies on who at least in the next few years is going to come to rely on something like universal health care is going to come to rely on on a lot of the policies that Bernie's campaign was was putting forth because you know for me a lot of these things are would literally be life and death would literally be how I could you know work and get medical care and all those kinds of things um especially as somebody who is you know an ind- who who works independently um and so i think that you know grappling with that is what is making a lot of people especially of my generation as healthcare and think and 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 wages and the the cost of living you know that increases and healthcare becomes even more polarized and inaccessible we're kind of being like we're we're being faced with a lot of the brunt of that because we are going to we're literally going through the years and where we can you know we're no longer under our parents care and all that kind of stuff so it feels really scary and i think that is why many many people um are we're so like bernie or bust or we're so kind of invested in in that campaign because it spoke to us in a way that no other politician really had um so i definitely do because i was i very much had that same experience i i i very much relate to that um but having to kind of once he kind of decide once he you know terminated his campaign and having to kind of come again once again to the this kind of more realistic view of i think I, again i started to realize like my all i can all i can really do now is continue the fights that i've always been fighting and just hope that whoever you know however this election does play out some some of those more progressive policies will be adopted and that we can just get through the next four years yeah and allow those our fights for these policies these life-changing and life-saving policies of something as simple as raising the minimum wage as simple as you know universal health care that so many other countries have done you know allow those things to become closer and closer to becoming realities and continue to fight for them regardless of what's happening at the top level of the political system because to me i'm just you know i'm starting more and more to really internalize that what happens at the grassroots level is really what does matter um and i think that continuing to fight those fights and and i think this is where that sense of futurist optimism does really really matter is as bleak as things feel at the top it is important to not you know not suspend your push for some kind of progress because as individuals maybe it does feel powerless but you do have to realize there are it, this is a collective effort and it always will be and i think that you know it uh, my hope is that even if trump gets elected for four more years or even if biden even even if you even regardless of how you feel about biden his you know you know even if we are disappointed with him being the democratic candidate or him eventually winning the presidency like even if your view is, is is that that is something that is disappointing either way you it needs to inspire a continuation of a fight because i think we are closer than we have ever been 
to to implementing a lot of progressive ideals in some way into our into our into our political system and again as much as that isn't a complete radical overturn a complete radical change it's something and that something can be life changing for a lot of people what's funny as you're saying it really what part of what you said is sort of the embodiment of the sort of optimism that FM talks about, which basically means that we're not stuck. It may feel stuck sometimes, may feel like it's, it's um, unimaginable that we're gonna get through on a personal basis, but that there is a hope, not just a hope, but an activism really, that we can affect change and that things don't have to be stuck forever and that we don't have to be stuck in a, in a system or in systems, whether they be political you know, or otherwise, that are gonna, that are unfair, basically, that are allowing certain people to have privilege and others not to. And and I think, if anything, you know, this the sentiment that you just expressed of feeling power or some power, maybe not complete power, but a power in the collective, a power that your voices can be heard. I mean, I think that's really what he was getting at. He, I think he said, like, you know, the first time in the bit, the most radical shift we can have is one of attitude. And I think that's the first thing to feel that you do have some power, even seeing all these obstacles and that those obstacles aren't s static, that those obstacles can be moved, maybe not moved by you, but moved by you and a few million other people, things will shift. And so that, that's, 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 that's a great place to end actually, <laughs> probably. We can shift things.